It's one thing if the Colorado Rockies don't want to field a competitive baseball team. It's another thing entirely if the Rockies are not keeping fans safe at Coors Field. Our meteorologist Chris Bianchi counted nine lightning strikes within six miles of Coors during the eighth and ninth innings today. Chris said simply, they shouldn't have been playing with lightning hitting so close to the stands. A meteorologist who specializes in tracking lightning in Colorado says this is an example why Major League Baseball needs a league-wide lightning policy. It only takes one poorly located lightning strike to really cause impacts to the rest of your life. Um, so when you do hear thunder, when you do see lightning, take those precautions, go inside until the lightning is over. You know, we just want you to be safe and then you can get back out and play ball. Chris Vigeski, who you heard from there, says his research shows Coors Field is one of the most lightning-prone stadiums in Major League Baseball. Between 2016 and 2019, he says there are 49 Rockies home games with a lightning strike within eight miles of Coors. National Weather Service generally recommends a weather delay if lightning is within six to ten miles. Six to ten miles is what NWS says. Again, we counted nine lightning strikes within six miles of Coors while they were playing today. We reached out to the Rockies, did not hear back. Danielle, we're already into the part of the year where we're seeing lightning deaths in Colorado. Mm -hmm. We know that that is the most dangerous thing that the weather ever throws at us. And you could just kind of hear the frustration in our newsroom and weather yeah. office today as you see the Rockies playing yeah. and you can see the strikes in the background. What gives? You know, we were looking at Twitter too and people were uh, posting videos where you could easily see the lightning strikes out. Take a breather, go get a Rockies dog, grab a beer and uh, just kind of get to safety because lightning actually can arc 15 miles away. So just because you might see some sunshine in front of you doesn't mean that potentially you could see lightning or even get struck. Across downtown Denver tonight, still a couple of rain showers out there. Still, the majority of these storms are below severe limits. That at least is some good news, but it's still packed with a lot of lightning out there. I just threw on the tracker more than 350 strikes, those mainly across the urban corridor. You can see up into the northern metro area, Longmont, Platteville, getting a good dose of rain as well as looks like a little bit of hail too, just to the north of Firestone. And then out there near Aurora, some heavy rain out toward DIA. That might slow them down, especially with these lightning strikes within that vicinity right there around I-70. You're going to be looking at heavy rain, possibly even some small pea size uh, nickel size hail within that cell. I'll zoom out and still another round of thunderstorms moving across far southeastern Colorado through Kim. A lot of lightning out there up toward Colorado Springs too. So this is pretty much the name of the game. We actually have been looking, Kyle, at a really quiet weather season in the springtime for the past three years. This is what Colorado should be looking like. And again, I'll let you know if these thunderstorms afternoon, day after day are going to stick around for Memorial Day weekend coming up in a few minutes. We'll let you know if we hear from the Colorado Rockies. Danielle thank you. The Jefferson County Sheriff's Office is investigating some far-right internet influencers who were posing with weapons outside Columbine High School last night. Dude, these are, really? are you me? This is all fake. The deputy who arrived on scene, apparently from what he said there, could not believe what he was seeing. Investigators got calls last night about this live stream. Two men on the Columbine High campus with guns. They were talking about how the 1999 mass shooting was supposedly a false flag. This is that garbage about how far-right conspiracy theories uh, claim that mass shootings are staged by the government to promote gun control. This particular live streamer has a history with white nationalists as well. At this point, the men have just been giving a trespassing citation. The sheriff's office would not discuss whether the guns there in the video were fake, which is what the live streamers claim. Prominent Republican from Colorado is resigning from the leadership of the American Conservative Union. Former Congressman and gubernatorial candidate Bob Beaupre says he does not trust that organization's financial statements, which is kind of a big deal because Bob Beaupre was the treasurer. Beaupre's resignation letter, according to the Washington Post, said that that group that most famously runs the CPAC conferences could end up facing lawsuits or even criminal prosecution. The CPAC conference has kind of drifted since the Trump years from being more of a Republican mainstream event to now aligning itself with far right figures, both in the U.S. and with authoritarians abroad. The first bank center has been a bad investment for taxpayers. The city of Broomfield is now giving up on that event center along U.S. 36. It's probably going to be demolished. That prompted our Steve Stager to ask, 
is it really a good idea for the government to be in the stadium business? The time has come to rip the Band-Aid off. When Broomfield does that, they will expose a gaping wound that is the First Bank Center, an arena meant to be an economic generator that never really generated. Well, it is an economic generator for whoever holds the bonds the city took out to build the building. $60 million in bonds back in 2006. And by the time the Broomfield Urban Renewal Authority pays it off, they'll have paid $135 million. First Bank Center can't compete with... Uh, with, with cool, fresh venues. The Urban Renewal Authority voted this week to cut ties with Peak Entertainment, the private operator of the venue, a blend of AEG and Cronky Sports and Entertainment. They've been booking concerts and paying the city a percentage of the revenue, no more than $325,000 a year. The community will remember some, you know, pretty, pretty hopping in um, uh, shows there. When they built this thing, they expected 180 to 190 events a year. Since 2009, the most concerts they've had in a single year is 33. In general, governments are good at doing things that private businesses can't do themselves. J.C. Bradbury is an economist who studies public stadium subsidies. That's where they're normally not as efficient as private uh, entities at, at managing these types of facilities. First Bank was meant to drive economic impact in this area of U.S. 36 in Wadsworth. Economists have studied the economic impact of sports facilities really for, for well over 50 years. And th the results are the same every time. The, lim the impacts are very, very small. Sometimes they're negative. The city says the area is booming now. In 2020, the local urban renewal area was able to make the full bond payment for the arena for the first time. Arista is now popping. The popping uh, was expected to occur 12 years ago, 13 years ago. It just came too late. Clearly, someone was just itching to build a facility and they got it built. And then imploding a facility like that is not abnormal. It happens. My wife always makes fun of me when I say something cool is popping. Uh, there are only two shows on the calendar before the contract is set to end this year. They're hoping to get the operator moved out of that building by late November. Then they'll get the building demolished, hopefully by early next year. The city owns that land. They'll likely sell it. One of the added costs I found interesting in this is that Broomfield actually provided policing oh, that's nice. for that area. So they were paying a lot of overtime. Yeah. This will also reduce the cost there for the city. When it comes to that, so the two shows left are these are these acts we would know. Are they bringing in any of that oons oons stuff? Well, they've brought in the oons. I don't, you know I don't know the two shows that are left on the calendar. Yeah. They've brought in the oons oons stuff, and the oons oons stuff was a problem because specifically in the document presented to city council, they talked about EDM shows. Yeah, how they become so popular there. Seventy three percent of their medical calls have gone to those EDM shows. They've had a bunch of public indecency citations, a lot of, a lot of drug arrests yeah, you don't say. Uh, surrounding that. Uh, yeah. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. Oh, yeah. huh. all right. Well, those shows are going to go someplace else. Yeah, no. they got to drop the base somewhere else. They're going to drop the base somewhere else. Steve yeah. Sager, thank you. Speaking of stadium funding, on the issue of whether taxpayer dollars should be used for a new Broncos stadium, the Denver mayoral candidates have each switched positions to each other's position. It was a rare, synchronized, double flip-flop on an issue. Now, remember what we always say around here. Everyone, politicians included, should change their mind from time to time. That's just natural. And the key is to ask why, right? So we asked both candidates, why'd you change your mind? Mike Johnson used to be open to taxpayer funding for a new Bronco stadium if it went up for a public vote. He said so in our candidate questionnaire and on our debate stage. Now. Johnston is opposed to taxpayer funding for a new Bronco stadium. His team tells me that he has researched the issue further. He has seen how stadiums across the country are being built without taxpayer money, and Johnston now thinks it can be done that way here. Kelly Bruff previously said no when we asked on our candidate questionnaire whether taxpayer money should be used for a new Bronco stadium. Now, Bruff says yes, if it passes a public vote. Bruff's team attempted to convince us that she has not actually changed her position, and that she had interpreted our questionnaire to mean money from the city's general fund, which I promise you is absolutely not what the questionnaire said. The economist J.C. Bradbury, who you heard from earlier, says the trend is now to try and work around voter approval for stadium funding because it, it fails a lot, and owners often have an easier time convincing a city council or a state legislature to give up the cash instead.
You think your Excel bills are bad? This guy's been charged for his neighbor's bill for 16 years. I'm probably looking around $10,000 or, or so. Can he get that money back from Excel? Everybody shout your guests at the TV at the same time. An emotional goodbye for two teachers who built a career and a family for decades together at the same school. Next. Excel Energy tells us to conserve energy, to save money. So he turned down the thermostat in the winter. Tonight, we meet a Coloradan who did that and more and could not reduce his Excel bill no matter what he tried. It's no wonder because he was being charged for his neighbor's energy use for more than a decade. Here's Marshall Zellinger. According to the construction company, this should have been my meter. Austin Todd um, is you know, not a gas meter expert, but today he's going to play one on TV. This is the one I was paying for. These are the row of townhomes where Austin lives in Superior, and these are the gas meters that service those townhomes. For a couple of years, I have felt frustrated because I've been trying to um, reduce my usage. His reduced usage did not lead to reduced bills, which brings us back outside. So, so this would be the neighbor that um, I'm, I have been charged uh, his gas usage. Austin was getting billed for someone else's gas meter. The meter number listed on my bill matched my neighbor's meter. It's been wrong since the construction of these townhomes, which they, they were basically built in around the year 2000, so over two decades. And, and I myself have lived here since about 2006, so about 16 years. Excel sent Austin this spreadsheet showing what he was billed on the left and what he should have been billed on the right. For instance, in January, when everyone was getting sky-high gas bills, he paid $241, when the bill should have been 54 bucks. And in December 2021, he paid $230 too much. I was re refunded $1,600 for two years. I mean, you kind of extrapolate that out. I'm probably looking around $10,000 or, or so. When Excel underbills someone, the company can charge the customer for the missing amount for the previous six months. When Excel overbills someone, the company is supposed to refund two years. It is what the commission decided as far as the treatment uh, years ago. Uh, it's something the commission could look at sometime in the future. But PUC Deputy Director Gene Camp told me that Excel is required to keep at least three years worth of electric billing records and four years of gas billing records. So Excel does have more data if it wanted to go beyond the requirement. I'm going to speak with them and tell them I'm not uh, agreeable to this. I would hope that they would have at least going back, you know, like a decade or so. Let's talk about the other guy for a moment. I left him a, a voicemail. It didn't get back to me so far. But if Excel wanted to, they could go after six months worth of non-payment for the bill he didn't realize he wasn't getting. And that is, let's see, $905 or so is what Austin paid for the last six months when he shouldn't have been paying that much. He should have only been paying 223 so the guy who was getting this benefit could owe Excel $681. That, that's wild. Like, how in the world would you know? Because we've all gotten bills that don't feel right, but don't feel right, and whoops, I've been <laughs> paying my neighbor's energy bill for 15 years are very different things. I, Austin went to extremes of like lowering his water heater, lowering the heat, and he finally went outside and his bill said like 5,200 therms. And so he was trying to match it up for the five, the two, the zero. And he ended up seeing one that said seven and whatever else, which is what his, his home meter was labeled at outside. So we finally found the one that had the five, the two, the five and the zero. And he's like, that's supposed to be my meter, but the meter number doesn't match the one that's on my bill. And then that's what started the whole process. We have to know how much money he gets back. We have to know. And next time I'm at my neighbor's house, I'm going to turn down their thermostat too, just to be safe. <laughs> Still looking pretty ominous out there across downtown Denver and beyond. This area of low pressure is the one we have to blame or thank maybe for all of these afternoon into the evening thunderstorms and more moisture is on the way. We're going to be looking at another round that rolls in tomorrow too. Here are about 9 o'clock. Most of the action is east of I-25. Still some stronger cells around I-76 heading into parts of Nebraska overnight into tomorrow. You can see by about 8 a.m. we're left with just a few clouds here in the city. Plenty of sunshine, a nice little warm-up, and then we do it all over again. No great surprise. 
highs to 3 o'clock. They'll be rumbling across the city and then kind of intensify just a bit the further north and east they go. So keep that in mind. Again, tomorrow, just like today, marginal threat for seeing severe weather for the entire eastern half of Colorado. Temperatures also pretty similar, too. It's a rinse lather repeat situation we have on our hands, folks. We'll be back to the 80s on Saturday. Storms more isolated. Right now, it looks fairly dry on Sunday and Monday for your Memorial Day. A high school says goodbye to two teachers with more than 95 years of experience between them. Everybody keeps telling me it's time and I'm starting to believe them. They also share a last name, some kids, you get it. It's a retirement celebration that's a family affair. Next. Nearly a century of teaching experience is walking out the door in the small town of Byers in Arapahoe County. Terry and Janelle Amundsen have 95 years combined in the classroom, all in buyers. Along the way, they fell in love, started a family, and they'll start retirement together as well. I mean, he's an institution in this school. You know, everybody kind of in the whole area knows who Mr. Amundsen is. Well, I started in 73. It's 2023, so it's been 50 years since I've been doing this, so I said, yeah, it's probably time to retire. <laughs> Today is the last day of school. It's one thing nice about this job is, is I've never minded coming to work. You know, you never kind of, in fact, sometimes even look forward to it. Yeah, that's my wife. Janelle, yeah, she's in the business department over there. That's where we're going to her classroom. Just kind of loving that last experience. This is my wife, Janelle. <laughs> he was already teaching here. So in one sense, you could say we had a high school romance. 45 years she's been here. So it would be a good time to both of us leave and take a new adventure to life. Everybody keeps telling me it's time, and I'm starting to believe them now. So, you know, <laughs> as long as I have, have my keys in my pocket, I'll, I'll still be kind of a connection. But once I turn the keys over, That'll be, that'll kind of hit me probably more. That's, this is it, so. Now I want to recognize our, our folks who are retiring. We've got um, 45 years of service, Janelle Amundsen. I'm gonna miss the, the kids and the interaction, especially watching them grow. When you see that success of a kid, you also feel that success. 50 years of service. Terry Just such a great person to have as a, as a mentor um, for a new coach and a new teacher. We also got him another plaque that was congratulating him on 50 years of coaching track, and I wanted to give it to him here uh, today. Thanks, Coach. Thank you. When you really like what you do, it's, it's a little harder to give it up. But uh, don't want to overstay your welcome, you know. Amundsen's are the kind of people whole towns are built around. We'll have your feedback next. Feedback on the Rockies playing on with lightning strikes near Coors. John says, pretty sad my rec softball league has more stringent lightning stoppage requirements than Major League Baseball. Julio says, the two people in attendance should take shelter. Julio. That was funny. Julio.